Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and thanks everyone um, for being here this morning. It's a pleasure to be here. In my presentation, I'm going to look at economic, social and cultural rights in Irish constitutional law, and I'm going to do so in three steps. First, I'm going to look at the all-important text of the Irish Constitution. Secondly, I'm going to look at how that text has been interpreted and implied by the Irish courts. And thirdly, I'm going to look at Ireland's wider constitutional framework, and in particular, the influence of EU law on our own domestic constitutional law. So let's begin with the text of the Irish Constitution. Now, as you're aware, the Constitution was drafted and adopted in 1937, and at that time, um, economic, social and cultural rights didn't enjoy the prominence that they now enjoy in the international commitments that Liam has referred to and in other constitutions around the world. And indeed, what's perhaps most surprising about the 1937 constitution is that it makes any reference to economic, social and cultural rights. And it does make some limited references to those rights, which it's important for you to take into account in your discussions today. And the first references are in Article 42 of the Constitution, which deals with the right to education. The first paragraph of Article 42, which is set out in the paper um, that has been handed out to you all, refers to the rights of parents to provide for the education of their children. And what's of more interest to us today is perhaps paragraph four of Article 42, which sets out a duty on the state to provide for free primary education. Now that duty, even though it's expressed in the language of duty, has been held by the Supreme Court to give rise to a corresponding right to free primary education on the part of children. Now in the high profile Jamie Sinnott case, the Supreme Court said that this right to free primary education stops when a child reaches adulthood at the age of 18, even if their needs for basic primary education go on. So it's an important right, but it's a right that's not without its limits. The second right that's actually enshrined in the text of the Constitution is also in Article 42, but it's broader than the right to education. This is a right of a child in exceptional circumstances to have protection from the state. So where parents of a child have failed in their moral duty towards this child, the state can, as an exceptional matter, step in to protect the child, not only in respect of the education, but the courts have confirmed this also includes the child, ch a child's other basic needs, for example, accommodation and so on. And we'll look at that right in, um, applied by the courts in a case that I'll refer to later on. And the final right that's expressly provided for in the Constitution is a labour right, the right to form a union or association, which is set out in Article 40, Paragraph 613 of the Irish Constitution. But that's pretty much it when it comes to economic, social and cultural rights in the text of the Constitution itself. Now there are some other right, um, provisions of the Constitution that are relevant to the broader tableau of economic and social cultural rights that Liam has talked to. For example, Article 8, which recognises Irish as the first official language of the state and also recognises English as a second um, official language. The courts have drawn on those provisions to recognise some limited language rights under the constitution. And finally, as, as Liam has so clearly outlined, economic and social and cultural rights can't be neatly compartmentalised um, from civil and political rights. The two are independent and interact in all sorts of important ways. And in particular, the Irish constitution recognises the right to equality under Article 40, Paragraph 1 of the Constitution, and also the right to property under Article 40, Paragraph 3, and also Article 43 of the Constitution. And those rights, and many other of the expressly protected rights in the Constitution, have very important socio-economic dimensions, which it's important to take account of. So that's the express rights enshrined in the Constitution. But it's not the end of the story when it comes to the text of the Constitution, because there's a curious provision in Article 45 of the Constitution for what's known as directive principles of social policy. Now, this sets out some very no noble, um, a noble vision of Irish society um, from the drafters of the Constitution. It talks about the state striving to promote the welfare of the people of, as a whole. It talks about the right of citizens to an adequate means of livelihood, the duty on the state to safeguard the economic interests of the weaker sections of society. Language which to present day ears connotes economic, social and cultural rights as we see them protected in international in instruments. 
And while these, these provisions were initially to be found in the fundamental rights provisions under the Constitution in Article 40 to 44 um, of the Constitution, Mr. de Valera and the drafters of the Constitution decided that, in fact, it was more appropriate to place them in this separate provision in Article 45. And when we look at the rest of the text of the um, Article 45, we see why. Because Article 45 says that these principles are intended for the general guidance of the Oireachtas. The application of these principles, Article 45 says, shall be the care of the Oireachtas exclusively, and they shall not be cognizable by any court under the provisions of the Constitution. So they're not within the jurisdiction of the courts, essentially. So there's this important social vision set out in Article 45, but it's directed at the political organs. I'm sure many members of the Oireachtas who are here today have had sleepless nights worrying about how to put these directive principles of social policy into practice. But those concerns haven't found their way into the debates of the Oireachtas in any meaningful way. And the courts, while for, forbidden from looking at Article 45 to a large extent under the Constitution, have nonetheless sometimes strayed onto this forbidden terrain. So Article 45 is, as I said, a very curious provision. Unlike the other provisions of the Constitution, the role of the courts is very, very limited indeed. And as a result of that, for all the noble aspirations of this provision, they've had very little effect in practice. So that's the text of the Constitution. And again, that's only part of the story, because in order to fully understand the Constitution, we need to understand how it's been interpreted and applied by the Irish courts. And what's of particular importance is in this regard is that the Irish courts have stated that the fundamental rights protected under the Constitution aren't confined to those rights which are expressly set out in the text of the Constitution. Under Article 40, Paragraph 3, which refers generally to the personal rights of the citizen, the courts have recognised a number of other rights not listed or enumerated in the Constitution itself. And these include some very important rights, such as the right to bodily integrity, which was the first such right recognized in the famous case of Ryan and the Attorney General, and also rights that we take for granted today, such as the right to privacy, the right to marry and procreate, the right to travel within and outside the state, obviously something with great residence, resonance in the context of debates about abortion and so on. And amongst those unenumerated rights, these rights that aren't listed in the Constitution, they've rec recognised a small number of economic, social and cultural rights. In particular, the right to work. So in a, in a case in the early 70s, the courts recognised that even though the right to work wasn't e explicitly set out in the Constitution, looking at the Constitution as a whole, and in that case, looking to Article 45, this forbidden territory of Article 45 setting out the directive principles of social policy, it could be implied into the Constitution that there was such a, a right to work or a right to earn a livelihood. And the courts have also lent support to the idea of a right to strike vesting in citizens under the Constitution. But that's pretty much where it stands. And some of the other unlisted or unenumerated rights, again, have important socioeconomic um, dimensions. So for example, the right to bodily integrity may in some exceptional cases mean that you have a right to a certain protection of um, some health care under the Constitution. For example, this has been recognized in the case of prisoners with certain health care needs. That that, there's a duty on the state to provide um, for the right of the citizen in that context. And they've also recognised that there's a right of access to the courts, something that Liam has alluded to in his presentation. And in certain circumstances, that can involve a right to legal aid, not just in criminal matters, but also in civil matters. So again, we're seeing the interaction between what we categorise as socio-economic rights on the one hand and civil political rights on the other. And it's important, again, not to divide too sharply between these two different categories of the rights. But even though the courts, for a few decades, quite enthusiastically found that there were all these rights um, not explicitly set out in the Constitution, but protected by the Constitution, after a certain period of time, they lost their enthusiasm for this doctrine of unenumerated rights. And when more and more rights were being invoked before the courts, the courts stood back from this doctrine, and they were unwilling to recognize further, far-reaching economic and social rights. And I'm just going to refer briefly to two very important cases addressing this point. The first is a case from the late 80s. It's called O'Reilly and Limerick Corporation. This was a very serious case where Mr. O'Reilly and a number of other members of the travelling community in Limerick were living in conditions of great deprivation on unofficial halting sites in Limerick. 
and they said that they had a right under legislation and under the constitution to have adequately serviced halting sites. And in particular, they said that even though it wasn't expressly set down in the constitution, they had a right to be provided with a certain minimum standard of basic material conditions. And Mr. Justice Costello in the High Court considered whether or not Mr. O'Reilly and his fellow members of the travelling community had this right to a minimum standard of living, essentially. And he said that it would go too far for the court to recognise this right where it wasn't expressly set out in the Constitution. And in his judgment, Mr. Justice Costello, who was in his time a member of the Oireachtas and a member of the government before, expressed concern that this would involve the courts trespassing on the on the role of the political organs, because it would involve the court in questions of allocating scarce national um, resources. And those decisions, Mr. Justice Costello said, were for the political orders. And Mr. O'Reilly's claim, he said in a very memorable phrase, should be advanced in Leinster House and not in the four courts. So here we see the court's support for further rights um, being rolled back on in the O'Reilly case. And also in a more recent case, TD and the Minister of Education, which raised a number of similar issues, and very challenging issues. This case, TD, involves a number of teenagers who are vulnerable and disadvantaged and who needed secure accommodation in high support units. And while the ministers, the government of the day, had committed to implement a policy to provide for their care, there had been great delays in the implementation of this policy. And because of those delays, the applicants went to the courts. So they went to four, four court, the four courts, not Leinster House. And after a period of time, the court started to lose its patience with the failure on the part of the government to actually implement the policy that they decided upon to provide these high, court, uh, high support units. And eventually, Mr Justice Kelly in the High Court granted an injunction, a mandatory injunction, an order forcing the government, the, minister, the relevant ministers, to implement their policies to provide for the care of these very vulnerable teenagers. Now that was quite a radical order and it was appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held that allowing the appeal by a majority decision, so four judges supported the decision and Mrs Justice Denham dissented um, from the decision, they said that the High Court had gone too far. And there's, it's a very complex decision and I just want to refer to two important elements of that decision. The first relates to the rights at issue. So this was a right of children to certain protection from the state, something that we've seen already has some express protection within the text of the Constitution. But there were concerns about the scope of this right and so on. For the purposes of the appeal, Chief Justice Keane was prepared to accept that such a right existed. But he went on to make a number of important comments in relation to further social and economic rights under the Constitution. He said that he had the gravest doubts as to whether the court should take on the function of declaring economic, social and cultural rights which warrant explicitly set out in the Constitution. So the court there is saying, our role is limited. We can't express, ex, um, protect what is not expressly set down in the Constitution. It's quite a different approach from that which pre prevailed a few decades before. And then the second really important aspect of the decision, the court said that a mandatory order, a an order forcing the government to take certain steps um, on foot of those rights, would go too far and would breach the doctrine known as the separation of powers, where the judges have their role, the judicial role, the parliament has its legislative role, and the government has its executive role. And basically, the courts would be interfering with the role of the parliament and the government if it was to grant this order, forcing the minister to implement its policy addressing this particular social problem, which would, of course, involve allocating scarce nas national resources and so on. So the very difficult um, issue before the court, and in the court's judgments, we see very different, different visions of the Constitution. What's the proper role for the courts? What's more properly for the political organs and so on? And the Supreme Court ultimately concluding in this case that the High Court, by making this mandatory order to force the government to take steps to vindicate this right, had gone too far. Whatever about making a declaration that the government was in breach, or even granting damages, actually Make, granting an order forcing the courts to take certain steps to implement a social policy of this kind was a step too far. So that's 
the vision set out in TD. Now, it's a vision which hasn't gone uncontested. Many commentators have criticised it, and the Supreme Court, in one or two of its later judgments, seems to accept that there may be some wiggle room there. There may be some, if there would be some exceptional circumstances in which the courts might intervene. What's important for you to know for the purposes of your discussion today is that the Supreme Court, in considering that issue, was looking at it from a very different vantage point from the vantage point that you're looking at the issue of including economic, social, and cultural rights in the Constitution there. There, the Supreme Court was grappling with the difficult issue whether it could imply certain rights and how far it could go in vindicating certain rights. You're considering the very different issue of whether those rights should actually be expressly enshrined in the constitutional text itself. So it's very important to be conscious of that distinction. And while some of the concerns raised by the Supreme Court may be important in your discussion, it's important to recognize that there are actually a very wide range of views on those very difficult issues. And finally, I want to look very briefly at part of our wider constitutional framework. Because Irish constitutional law today is not confined to the little blue book of Bunrock na Heron. Under Article 29 of the Constitution, the EU treaties also form part of Irish law. And under EU law, where those treaties apply, they prevail over conflicting national law, including constitutional law, such as the Bunrock na Heron. So it's a new and potentially radically radical influence on our domestic constitutional structure. And since 2009, the Charter of Fundamental Rights um, forms part of the supreme EU law. The Charter was a modern human rights instrument drafted um, around the turn of the millennium. And it includes not just civil and political rights or citizenship rights, it also includes a whole range of so social economic and cultural rights, including the rights, some of the rights we've heard about already, the right to work, the right to education, an entitlement to social assistance and social security, and even a right to health care and so on. So it goes much further than Bunrock na Heron itself. But there are two important issues to be aware of when it comes to this Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, the first one is that it only applies to, it, to Ireland in certain circumstances. So under Article 51 of the Charter, it applies when we're implementing union law. Now, so in situations governed by EU law, where there's an EU law element to a particular situation, the Charter will apply. Now, while a number of decades ago, that would just be limited to issues of free movement across the union, competition law and so on. EU law now applies in a whole range of areas. So employment law, um, immigration law, environmental law, even in traditionally insulated areas such as family law and criminal law, which normally form part of the domestic law purely. So the EU law has greater reach these days, and the Charter can apply in some of those areas. But still, there are important limits. And there are many areas of Irish law and Irish society which remain outside the framework of EU law. And in those areas, this Charter cannot be relied upon. The second important point to note is that the Charter in Article 52.5 differentiates between what are rights proper and what are principles. And it's the suggestion of Article 52.5 is that some of the socio-economic rights are in fact principles and not rights. And what does this mean? And it's not entirely clear from the Charter itself. But what it seems to mean is that you can only rely on these principles and possibly some of the socio-economic rights in limited circumstances before the courts. Primarily, these are to be implemented by the political organs, by legislative and executive acts and they can only be um, judicially um, recognized in certain limited circumstances. Now, we need guidance from the Luxembourg court as to what this particular provision means, but it may impose some limit on the extent to which you can rely on the Charter of Fundamental Rights. It doesn't go um, as far as Article 45 of the Constitution, which rules out the jurisdiction of the Irish courts when it comes to the directive principles of social policy, but it does set down some limit. And that's very complicated terrain. It's, it's, it's um, an area which is only being teased out at present. But it's important for you to recognize that this forms part of our wider constitutional structure, and within it, there are important protections for economic, social, and cultural rights. So just to conclude, the Constitution was very much a creature of its time. It included only the most limited ref references to economic, social, and cultural rights. As we saw, the right to education, limited right of children to protection, the right to form a union, and so on. 
And even though the courts recognize that there may be some further rights implicit in the constitutional text, in some of the more recent cases, it has stepped back from recognizing far-reaching socio-economic socio rights, such as the right to an adequate standard of living, and so on. And even though now in the Charter, within the scope of EU law, we have another reference point for economic and social cultural rights, these rights are subject to certain important limits, and they only apply within the field of EU law. So where there's some EU dimension to your legal issue or legal dispute, you can rely on these rights, but not beyond that. So if you judge the Irish constitutional framework by reference to the international commitments such as the Covenant and the European Social Charter, which Liam has talked about, the protection of economic, social and cultural rights in the constitution is undoubtedly incomplete. But although it's incomplete, as I set out in the paper, economic, social and cultural rights are not necessarily alien or anathema to the Irish constitution. And arguably, the most difficult issue for you today is not whether it's desirable in principle to recognize further economic, social and cultural rights. It's how to define those rights and their limits with care. And it's also how to develop effective methods of enforcing those rights. And just in case you feel daunted, I can reassure you that these are among the most difficult questions in contemporary constitutional law. And Ireland is not alone in facing them. We have IFA. And Aoife is going to give us some guidance on how other jurisdictions have addressed these difficult questions um, relating to the enforcement of socio-economic rights. So thank you very much for listening to me today. And best of luck with your deliberations.